to we're the Dutton family members of saving grace enjoy our service today good morning welcome worship on this beautiful Sunday morning today uh, we are celebrating the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, and you notice the flowers right down here. I believe those are, what are they called, Black-Eyed Susans? And I think they're from Donna Switzer and Evelyn Henninger are the ones that gave them to Donna Switzer. So those are old flowers, because <laughs> Evelyn, Evelyn Henninger was 106 when she passed away. So, <laughs> But I think it's a couple generations beyond what, what you first got. So. <laughs> so thank you for sharing those with us this morning. And uh, why don't we stand as we begin our worship? We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Forgive us when we are stubborn and rebellious and want to have our own way. Lord Jesus, you called us to faith and trust in you, that you may work in and through our lives beyond what we can comprehend. Forgive us when we limit your work in the world because we lack faith and are afraid. Holy Spirit, when we are weak, you show your strength in our lives. Teach us to boast in our weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may be seen. Let's pause for a moment of personal reflection and self-examination. Almighty God, through your Holy Spirit, you sent the prophets to call your people back to you. You have called us to faith in Jesus Christ that you may work in and through our lives to call people to faith. Forgive us when we get lost in wondering what we can be and when we doubt your ability to change lives. Through faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you who do truly repent and believe in Jesus Christ, the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And let us pray. Almighty God, through your Holy Spirit and the waters of baptism, you have called us to faith in Jesus Christ. Your grace is sufficient for us. In our weakness, your strength is revealed. Teach us to be faithful to your calling and to place our trust in you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Uh, Vacation Bible School is coming up. That's July 22nd, so you can sign up your child or grandchild uh, in the church office. And the, uh, the uh, theme is Shipwrecked, Rescued by God. Now, we uh, need, need some more people to volunteer to help out with uh, Vacation Bible School. So if you can do that, then contact Stephanie Epson, our education director. And we also have a place for a Thrivent member to be a part of the action team. Um, so an action team mon money. So if you are a Thrivent member and haven't used uh, two of your action team monies, then uh, see the office and we'll help you with filling it out online. Or um, if you know how to do that, um, just tell us that you're doing that, okay? Thank you so much. Our first lesson today is taken from Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He said to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet, and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impu impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, Whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. The word of the Lord. Be Our second reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2-10. through 10. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. 
but on my own behalf I will not boast, except for my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with the weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all this? And what is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not, these, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometowns and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except he laid his, hand, his hands on a few sick people and cured them. He was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not, uh, and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. And if any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. And so they went out and proclaimed all that, that all should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Do you remember when you'd come back from summer vacation and, they'd, uh, and you'd give a little report what I did on summer vacation? Wasn't that fun? That always made me nervous. <laughs> so I usually didn't have much to say. Um, in our lives, sometimes um, we're worried most of all about the what ifs in life. What if, what if this happens? What if something uh, terrible happens? What if... I can't control the situation, and all of a sudden, this happens. And we spend most of our time doing that. My father, actually, um, and he had a reason to do this, but whenever I'd come home just a little bit late, he'd usually say, well, I, I thought you were probably in a car accident or in the hospital or something, he'd say. He'd sit in the corner in a little, in a little chair, well, kind of a big chair, and he'd sit in the corner in, in the dark with one light on and wait for me to come home. 
And that was even if I came home like five minutes late, you know. He worried. He worried about all kinds of things. He said, he'd say I, he was worrying about me. Now I didn't understand that until I went on vacation. <laughs> so, I, so I went on vacation, went up to uh, Alexandria, Minnesota. You know, got my long O back. <laughs> And I uh, went up there, and Kari and Magnus, and, and I went up there, and then part of Kari's family, and I saw my mom, I saw my uh, sister, and we had a nice time. And um, I even went fishing, went fishing for 15 minutes. That's all the time I had. And I caught uh, three crappie and one smallmouth bass. Not too bad, 13 inches long for the bass, so that was okay. And I, I actually, I was really happy because the first time I threw in threw my line in the in the water, I caught a crappie. I'm like, this is good, this is good, life is good. And then uh, little Magnus was enjoying everything, and then all of a sudden, um, he got a fever. You know, fever of 104. Yeah, that's what I thought too. And so we gave him uh, some ibuprofen, the kid stuff, and. It came down, but it came down to 101, and then six hours later we gave him some more, and then it came down from there, and, but then he got hives all over him, and all kinds of stuff were going on, and that was uh, part of the fourth, and then into the fifth, and uh, on Thursday, and then uh, we, were, we called uh, uh, to see if we could get into a hospital and just you know, visit, you know, urgent care type thing, and uh, they said, well, you need an appointment. You can go to the emergency room. But we can fit you in at 3.45. And so we drove all the way back and got home at 3.30. <laughs> and he got checked out and he got some medication. He's okay and everything's fine. And, you know, now I understand why my dad worried. You know? Dawn's on me. Yeah. And a lot of parents are nodding. Yeah. Because when someone that you love is not quite themselves, well, then you get a little worried. That's normal. We do that. And so what do we do when the what ifs start to eat us up? If we're thinking about the future or, you know, uh, my dad was worried about me because two weeks after I got my license, I totaled the car that we worked on all winter. Yeah. Sanded it down, had it painted. I think it was out for two weeks, and I got smashed, totally. That's why I was worried. I had a track record. <laughs> so I took a look at um, what uh, psychologists say about fighting life's what-ifs. There's an old Swedish proverb. It says, worry gives a small thing a big shadow, a big shadow. And I think that's true. You know, worry is like blood pressure. We need a certain amount or a certain level to live, but too much can kill you. And so you might, uh, you kind of think about the worst and the worst possible events, and then you are prepared for that. And, and yet in the midst of all that, you, you forget to enjoy the things that are going on in life right, right around you. So it can affect your physical being. Did you know that one in four of us? Uh, will have a, some type of anxiety disorder during our lifetime. That's 65 million Americans. Great. Well, don't tell your doctor because everybody will have one, right? <laughs> you know, um, worry can, can consume us, and yet we have to find freedom in the midst of that. So Paul tells us a little bit about worrying. He says... Uh, let me tell you about a person I know in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Now, all you have to do is mention something about levels of heaven, and already the uh, New Testament scholars are theorizing on how many levels there must be and how to reach them and what can happen and all this stuff. All he says is that I know somebody that was caught up in the third, third heaven. In the body, out of the body, I don't know. It doesn't matter whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know, but... but um, I, I know this, on behalf of such a one, I will boast. And not on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in my weakness. Paul was trying to explain that in his life, as he was going through life, he realized that God was doing amazing things, and, and it wasn't about boasting about those things. It was about boasting in Christ. See? 
And so to keep him from being too elated, it says there was a thorn in his flesh. Now, of course, New Testament scholars, theologians wonder exactly what that thorn is, you know. No, um, I won't even say it. It's a joke I could tell. I won't say it. <laughs> Mess, uh, it says there, a messenger from Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times he appealed to the Lord to take this away, and it would not leave. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness, so I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ might may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with my weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities, for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Do you hear that? Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. And um, as I was thinking about worry and all the things that consume us, the only way to become free from that worry is to realize that there's somebody else in control. Huh? To realize that if you can't do it yourself, and this is the beautiful thing about those things that you can't control, that when you leave it in the Lord's hands, He says, I can handle it. I can handle it. And not only that, but He gives you strength in the midst of whatever you're going through. Now, I, I still remember when I was uh, apl applying to become a pastor here. And, um, and what if I would have walked in and, and said what Paul said? He said, now, I'm talking like a madman, but I am a better one and far greater in my labors. Far more, uh, I've had far more imprisonments, uh, countless floggings. Five times I received uh, 40 lashes minus one, three times... I was beaten with rods. I was stoned once. Uh, three times I was shipwrecked, the drifted sea, and it goes on and on and on. It talks about all the things that happened in his life. What if I came in and said that? I think you'd say, next. <laughs> Paul is boasting of those things because he's saying, you know what? I will boast of those things that, that make me human. My weaknesses, those things that I cannot control because in the midst of that, that's where God is precisely in control. I trust him. It's faith. I won't worry about the what ifs. I'm going to concentrate on, on God's grace is sufficient for me. And so he encourages us to do the exact same thing. Now Jesus goes to his hometown, went up to Alexandria. You know what happens whenever I go into Alex? I'll go into, it doesn't matter, I'm, I stop to put gas in the, in the car and I'm looking around, it, you know. I'm looking around to see if I know anybody, because they know all my stories. <laughs> going to Target, I'm wondering, is that someone I know? And then I'm looking and I'm going, that kind of looks like, is that his, his or her kid? I don't even know. So I'm always worried about something, you know. Jesus goes to his hometown. The truth is, I don't want them to start telling stories about me in front of my wife, you know. <clears throat> Jesus came to his hometown. The disciples were following him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the Sabbath. And as he was teaching, they said, where did this man get all this? What, what is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? Son of Mary? Aren't, aren't his brothers James and Joseph, Judas and Simon, by the way, aren't his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. Wait a second. How can this guy know all this? And Jesus said, prophets are not with, without honor except in their own hometown, among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there. He didn't have faith. And so he laid hands on a few sick people and cured them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Those who knew him best didn't understand who he was. How about that? Yet the disciples who saw him by a shore when he said, follow me, followed him. So we're called to do the same thing. It's probably good that we didn't know Jesus when he was growing up. I'm not saying yeah, he was perfect. I know he was perfect. And yet, they still couldn't believe it. They still couldn't understand. And, and yet, in the midst of that, how do, what does Jesus do? He sends out the disciples. He sends them out two by two, and he says, by the way, 
I want you to have a $54 million air jetliner plane. No, he doesn't do that. Are you kidding me? And actually, one of the New Testament scholars comments on, on that. He says, do you realize he sent them out with nothing? He, they could carry nothing back. They weren't to profit from what they were doing. They actually went out and, uh, to preach the kingdom of God is at hand. And so they went out two by two, and he ordered them to take nothing for their journey except for a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on even two tunics. And so they did that. And then he says, whenever you enter a house, he said, stay there until you leave that place so that people don't go, you know, uh, this guy that's come into town, well, he's staying at my house tomorrow, you know. Instead, stay at that one place and then go on from there. And if they don't receive you, then shake the dust off your feet. Now, I looked at that to see what it meant. You know what it means? It means I, want, I, I don't want anything to do with this, this town. I'm shaking the dust off my feet so that I won't even remember you. Wow. And so it's a precursor to understanding that Jesus says later in Mark uh, 8, 39, for whosoever is ashamed of me in the words of this, in a, this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory of the Father with the holy angels. What ifs? They went out two by two and they came back and they told amazing stories of what had taken place. And sometimes we're still caught up in what ifs. Well, consider the lilies of the field, huh? They neither grow, they, uh, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. Huh? If God so clothes the grasses of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? For the Gentiles who strive for all these things will indeed, uh, and indeed your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own today. Today's trouble is enough. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? If I was to worry about all the things that my little son will get into, hokey Pete, <laughs> I wouldn't sleep at night, right? So every night, and I'm sure you do the same thing, I say, Lord, he's in your hands. Every morning, whenever I have to leave him, I say, Lord, he's in your hands. There's no better place, huh? He can more than handle it. And I trust them. There's a, this psychologist that I read <clears throat> earlier on. Usually they don't say much about faith. As he was talking about how to deal with worry, he said, first of all, you can, re you can go through in your mind very quickly what might happen and then say, this is what I'll do if that happens. You can rehearse those things and then uh, work out your worry. And then he says, but don't wring your hands clasp them. I thought that was really nice. Don't wring your hands, clasp them. That we should actually pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I am in your hands. I'm trusting you for what you will do. Now, you heard the feasibility study. And you saw the numbers. And if that was alarming, it should be. You know those numbers were huge. And the truth is, maybe, maybe we're still grieving a little bit. Huh? Maybe we want all the space that we used to have. That's okay. But what does he call us to? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Huh? Is he always faithful? He's always faithful. Has he been faithful to us? Oh, more than you can imagine. Huh? More than you can imagine.
Christ always gives us the strength for tomorrow, huh? There's a little LCMC church in Alexandria, Minnesota. You know? They started about 2008. They built a little, little church. It looks like a country church. It's really cute. It's really nice. I went and worshiped with them. This was a few years back. And uh, it's not an extravagant structure, but it, it's just really, really neat. It's in an upcoming part of town, and the high school is just down the street. And I think they paid somewhere around $1.7 million or something for it. And you know what? In three years, they had that paid off, and they were looking at their second building that they were going to add on. Is God faithful? You better believe it. Was it all the space they wanted? No. Some of them came from First Lutheran Church, where I grew up. That was a lot larger. Now First Lutheran is thinking about pulling up stakes and building. My, mom, my mom's first husband, who passed away, uh, said, yeah, they're going to build right across from the LCMC church. And I said, oh, well, that's good. Now we're streaming live, so I won't say anything more. But that's okay, as long as the word gets out, huh? We call people and pastors especially to be faithful to it. You know, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness, so I'll boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. For when I am weak, then he is strong. You know, it's a matter of faith, not what ifs. So be it, Lord. Amen. does bear us up. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.